Now, for more on this story, we can bring in France 24's Valerie in the camp. Good to see you, Valerie. COP26 is just a few days away, and clearly we're way, way off track. We're nowhere near what we, where we need to be, and that is the conclusion of this report. Every year, the UN releases the so-called emissions gap report. It doesn't sound very exciting, but it's a highly anticipated, crucial report. And essentially, it looks at the gap between current climate commitments and where we should be if we want to meet the uh, targets, the objectives set by the Paris Agreement. And traditionally, it comes out just before uh, the UN Climate Summit, and it can uh, have a huge impact on climate negotiations. So what exactly is in this report? Let me show you one graph that I have here. So with the latest climate commitments brought forward by more than 100 countries, we should be looking at a 7% reduction in CO2 emissions by 2030. But in order to limit global warming uh, to 1.5 degrees Celsius, we need to cut emissions by 45 almost 55% by 2030. So that's the gap. It's a huge gap, as you can see. And at COP26, leaders will need to bridge that gap. Uh, and if you translate that uh, these emissions into temperature projections, I have another graph that I want to show you here. It doesn't look good either. Uh, so you see with the latest uh, climate commitments, we uh, are heading towards a rise in temperatures 2.7 degrees and bearing in mind that the planet has already warmed by 1.2 degrees. And, and, you know, a lot of work needs to be done, clearly, at the COP26 summit. Can world leaders make up for lost time? Because we do have pledges. Look, Australia today. Right. Well, the number one priority, actually, at COP26 will be to get more countries to commit to carbon neutrality by 2050. So far, 49 countries have done so, uh, plus 27 EU member states. Uh, those countries combined, they account for 55 percent of global emissions. So that's clearly not enough. And as you just mentioned, Australia has just joined the carbon neutrality by 2050 a club. And I think Australia is a great example um, to sort of to, to explain why we should be cautious. So unless countries don't enshrine into law their net zero pledges, as you just mentioned, and it unless means, they don't, uh, they're not going to do that. Yeah. Exactly. And unless they don't come up with more ambitious targets for 2030, then it's pretty much all meaningless. Again, Australia is not going to do any of that, not enshrine into law their net zero plans. And actually, their latest commitments, they're exactly the same commitments they brought forward in Paris nearly six years ago. So nothing has really changed for Australia. Uh, now, the second priority to go back to COP26 will be finance. And we'll, it will be crucial to see if countries are willing to, uh, you know, bring more money on the table for poorer countries. And there's a real risk, and this is what analysts have been saying, that there could be a rift between the North and the South if countries don't come up with more money. So far, rich countries have committed uh, $100 billion every year, but we're consistently $20 billion short. Last but not, not least, carbon markets will also be a crucial uh, point at COP26. Essentially, the rules of the game. Uh, how can we have uh, a fair, uh, you know, rules of the game for everyone and make sure that nobody cheats in this game. So that will be another uh, crucial point. So imagine 196 nations coming together to figure everything out it, there's going to be a lot of drama. It's going to last for two weeks, and we'll be following that, obviously, very closely. The Chinese president and the Russian president will no, will be no shows at the COP26. I did check, and uh, Prime Minister <laughs> Modi, India's prime minister, will be at the COP26 in Glasgow next week. Thank you very much for that, Valerie. Valerie DeCamp there.